The basics of inverse functions is something you've been using since you started solving equations. So like, don't think too hard about it. What's the inverse of addition? Subtraction. What's the inverse of multiplication? Yeah, What's the inverse of squaring something? So we're, okay, so we understand the concept of inverse functions. It's functions that undo different operations. So that's inverse operations. If we talk about inverse functions, they undo a particular function or relation. Every inverse can be found by switching each x and y value. In some situations, this, pro this process is intuitive, the way we just said, the opposite of addition is subtraction, multiplication, division, square, square root. A lot of that makes sense. However, some of the times it may not be as obvious on what you do to create an inverse function. In these cases, it's important that we understand just a general concept. That's not how you spell concept. Let me try that again. Of inverse functions, because again, it's really not that complicated until we make it complicated for ourselves. But there's many ways we're going to see inverse functions. So the first way we're going to look at this is numerically, so with a table. Then we're going to look at it graphically. Then we're going to look at it analytically. Our goal is to be able to nail it down analytically because the other two are really pretty simple. So from a table, to find the inverse relation of a given table, all again we have to do is switch the x and y values. So without further ado, look at me, I'm switching the x and y values. That first input value was 1 comma negative 1, so I just switch it. Now it's negative 1 comma 1. We had 3 comma 2, so now we have 2 comma 3. Then we have 0 comma 4 and 2 comma 6. We just switch the x and y values. That's its inverse. x and y switch. Here's something important to note, and it's really great that we actually asked this question during homework question times. Uh, talking about whether a relation is a function, what cannot repeat? The input values. Your x's cannot repeat. This has been a rule since forever. So our original table is a function, because notice none of these x values repeat. Because each x value has exa exactly one y value. However, look at the table we wrote for the inverse. Is this one a function? No, because now look what's happening. This one is not a function because the x value of 2 has two different output values. It has an output value of 6 and it has an output value of 3. So that's a good note for ourselves, that while we could find inverses of all functions, we may create relations instead of functions themselves. So got to be on the lookout for those repeating x's, either in our function or relation that we are creating an inverse for or in the inverse that we solved for. Again, table is really simple. You switch the x and y. Done. Don't overthink it. From a picture, you're still switching the x's and y's, but we're going to do this in a different way. First things first, we're going to list the key points in a table. So if we look at the key points, I'm pretty much talking about these guys right here. Especially because this is linear pieces, there's like four different functions put together to create this shape. We're going to create a table of x's and y's for these numbers. So if I have that first coordinate, it's at negative 2 comma negative 1. The next coordinate is at negative 1 comma 2. The next coordinate is at 2 comma 1. The next coordinate is at 4, 3. Are we okay with that? In fact, I'm going to change the way I've written this. Instead of calling this y, I'm going to call this f of x. If we want to create points for us to plot that are the inverse function, this time when we do x, we're going to call this f inverse. And all we're going to do is switch the x's and the y's. Bless you. So this becomes negative 1, negative 2, 2, comma, negative 1, 1, comma, 2, and 3, comma, 4. We plot those points. Don't overthink it. We're just plotting points. Negative 1, negative 2 is here. 2, comma, negative 1 is here. 1, comma, 2 is here. 3, comma, 4 is here. If I play connect the dots... we have our inverse function. I've switched all of the x's and y's. OK, 
Okay, so looking at the one that was printed on the paper, not the one we drew in, is the original function, sorry, is the original relation a function? Asking this question is really just asking, do any of the x values repeat in this function? No, what's that? That's a test that we probably haven't done again since like eighth grade or from Algebra 1. You like took your pencil and you did something with it to test if something was a function. What's that called? Yeah, does this one pass the vertical line test, the one printed on the paper? Yes, so we can say that the original function, I'm going to write this in red, the original function, I guess relation, is a function. And we're going to say due to the vertical line test. VLT for vertical line test, are you all okay with that? But if we look at the one we drew in there, our inverse function. Is our inverse relation a function? No, why not? Yeah, if you were to take your pencil and like pull it along this graph, there's like a whole bunch of points right here where there would be three outputs. So we would say that the inverse relation is not a function. Again, due to our vertical line test. We notice that between these values here, there's like three different output values for every input value. We only need one. Now, it is still the inverse of this function. It's just that the inverse is considered a relation, not a function, because the x's repeat. And that's cool. That's easy. That's great. Finding the important points and flipping the x's and the y's is really simple. There is another property, graphical property of inverses. Uh, that I think is a way easier to look at. Graphs of inverses are going to be reflections, which is like flips, over the line y equal to x. So not a reflection over the x-axis, not a reflection over the y-axis. It's a reflection over the diagonal that goes straight diagonal with a slope of 1. So it's going to look something like this. Start at the origin, go up with a slope of 1 and down with a slope of net. 1, so it's a y equal to x, a diagonal in the center of the graph. If we were to fold our piece of paper along that purple dotted line that I just did there, wouldn't one side land right on top of the other? That means that they're inverses of each other. We've switched the x's and the y's. Again, that's the basis of everything today. Inverses are found by switching the x's and the y's. Graphically, in a table, and also, segue, analytically. If we're going to create an inverse or write a function that's an inverse, we follow the steps in this little box, but look what the steps in the little box start with. We're still going to switch those x's and y values. We're then going to resolve the equation for y so that it still says y equal, and we're going to write it in the correct form, which means we're indicating it's an inverse with this notation f inverse of x. That's how you say that. It's like f with a little exponent of negative 1. That means f inverse. So let's follow these steps. It says step 1, switch the x's and the y's. Now a question I might hear in my head is, wait a second, there's no y on this problem. But what stands for y? f of x. So we really just, we know that that's y. We're going to go ahead and switch x and y. So it looks like this x equal to 3y minus 7. Do you see that I've just switched the x's and the y's? Make that 7 look nicer. Okay, next step says to solve for y. So I need to think about regular inverse operations, regular isolating variables, and solve for y, which means I'm going to add 7 to both sides to get that minus 7 to go away. And then what am I going to do to get y by itself? Divide by... Three. So I'm going to have x plus 7 divided by 3 equal to y. Now there's many ways that you could write a final answer here. The one I'm going to write is f inverse of x. I'm going to write it in two ways actually. x plus 7 divided by 3 or 1 third x plus 7 over 3. Do we see that those are the same thing? There's not one particular way that test writers, me, <laughs> I'm your test writer, will write the answer. So be prepared to see both. 
they're interchangeable, they're the same. So we switched the x's and y's, we resolved for y, we popped the correct notation on the front, which is f inverse of x to indicate that these two functions are inverses. Sound good? Now that's like almost way too easy because that's a linear equation. But what if we take another kind of function we studied in this class and we find the inverse of that function? Finding the inverse of rational functions. Remember, rational functions are the functions that look like this, 1 over x. But we're going to specifically look at one where there are multiple x's involved because the steps are a little bit, um, I don't want to say difficult, but they use a lot of different pieces of algebra that you've maybe not seen put together in this way. So I've got all of the steps there. I also have a fully worked example for you following these six steps. So I'm reading from the little table, but I'm going to show you this problem. It says, first step, switch all of the x's and the y's. Do you see that in this problem? So the f of x became an x. These two x's both became y's. Check. We switched the x's and y's. Step two, I did two things at once. I'm going to take this denominator, and maybe you want to notate this for yourself. I'm going to take this denominator, and I'm going to multiply it on both sides. So technically, the work looks like this. y plus 3 over here, y plus 3 over here. That looks like an x. Well, this on top and this on bottom are going to cancel. That's why I'm multiplying by it on both sides. But simultaneously, I'm going to go ahead and do this distribution on this side so that I have the next line of this equation. y times x is xy. 3 times x is 3x. So I multiply and distribute in one step. Step 3 says to move all terms that include the variable y to the left side of the equation and move all variables that do not, oh, sorry, all terms that do not include the variable y to the right side. So notice, this has a y, it can stay. This does not have a y, it needs to move. When I move it across the equal sign, it changes sign. Check. At the same time, this y needs to go back over there because it has a y on it, so I subtract it to both sides. Everything on this side has a y, everything on this side does not. Check. Okay. The next step says factor out a y from the terms on the left side of the equation. Do you notice that both of these terms have a y in them? We factor it out. That is reverse distribution. So I put it in front of a set of parentheses. When I do xy divide by y, the y's cancel. I'm left with x. y divide by y, I'm left with 1. Do we understand that step? Step 5 says divide both sides by the terms remaining on the left side after y was factored out which means I'm dividing both sides by x minus 1 because, again, just like I did the first time, that will cancel out. Then I have y isolated. I do any sort of simplification I need to on this side, and then, boom, I put my final notation on it, f inverse of x equal to negative x, 3x plus 2 all over x minus 1. Those are six steps. Can we apply those six steps to another problem? Let's give it a shot. I want you to try it on your own already. We've got the steps written in words, and you've got the steps written out with a different problem. It's just six steps. Give it a shot. Okay, I've, I've seen some really good thinking, so let's, let's go over it. Um, we'll go step by step. The first step tells me to do what with the letters? Switch the letters. Make sure you actually switch the letters, which means every X becomes a Y. And every y becomes an x. So this should be x equal to 2y plus 1 over y minus 3. It feels weird to write more than one y in an equation. I know that, but that's why this is the process for doing inverses. We will eventually get them back to being 1y. I'm going to multiply both sides by that denominator and simultaneously distribute it onto the other side. So this right side is just the numerator, 2y plus 1. The left side is going to be x times y minus 3, which is xy minus 3x. We multiply and distribute at the same time. I then see that there are two terms with y's on them. There's a y over here and there's a y over here. I need all of those terms on the same side. So the xy will stay. The 2y will subtract to the other side. The 3x will add to the other side. And I still have a balanced equation. I then notice that those y's, now that they're on the same side of the equation, they're in two separate terms. They are a GCF, greatest common factor. That means I can take them out with reverse distribution, that's called factoring, 
and still have a balanced equation. It's like I divided both terms by y, I put the leftovers in parentheses. Those leftovers in parentheses is what I should divide by, which means this will end up being y by itself. Yay, that's what we want. 3x plus 1 on top and x minus 2 on bottom. But of course, we want it to be in the correct notation, so we change just the y to f inverse to indicate that this is the inverse function for f. Nope, this isn't even f. What letter did we, were we supposed to use? G. G inverse of x is equal to 3x plus 1 over x minus 2. That way we're indicating that g from the paper and g to the negative 1, which is g inverse, are inverses of each other. How do we do? What are our questions? A moment that I know a lot of students get messed up on in the years I've taught this is this factoring step. If you notice that the term shows up in more than one term, the variable shows up in more than one term, you can take it out like you would divide by two. Some numbers that are all even, you would make them smaller by dividing by two. Same thing if they both have a y in them. It's kind of the process there. Let's talk a little bit more about graphing inverse functions because, again, we're going to leave this for a second. We'll practice this later class. When we're graphing functions, the one that we did before had all of those coordinate points because it was a bunch of linear pieces put together. We know, number one, that all we have to do is switch the x's and y's. How many times have I said the word switch today already? So many. That's so important. We're switching the x's and y's. Graphically, that means that the function, its inverse, will be a reflection over that diagonal line, y equal to x. We've talked about this. But it's not that simple when it's, the graph itself is not made up of line segments like the first one that we did. And most functions are not piecewise functions like the first one we did. So we're going to have a more difficult time graphing them, graphing their inverses, if we don't have some more steps. Here are the steps to sketch an inverse graph, one of those nonlinear pieces. So this is curves our quadratics, our cubics, our logarithmics, all of that. We are going to sketch that line y equal to x on the graph. So we're going to actually draw in that dotted line. You're going to mark any points from the original graph that are exactly on the line y equal to x. I'm going to do that in red. These are going to stay the exact same. Then you're going to select a few additional points on the original graph and find their inverse points. Remember, we find their inverse points by switching the x and the y values. Another way to do this, which I don't particularly do because my brain works the other way, but your brain may work this way, you can graphically reflect each point over the line by drawing a line perpendicular from the point to the line y equal to x and then extending it an equal distance on the other side of the line. So like if it takes you three jumps to go from your point to the dashed line, you go three jumps the other direction. So you just repeat that distance. My brain doesn't work that way, but yours might. So if you don't like the way I'm going to do it, I can go back over this method with you later. I just, my brain works the other way. Then we're going to sketch the graphs by playing connect the dots. Okay, let's sketch the inverse function of this quadratic. This quadratic has been translated to the right two units. We first start by drawing my dashed line y equal to x. I like to start at the origin and go up with a slope of 1 and then start at the origin and then continue that slope of 1 working backwards. Any place that your quadratic touches this purple dashed line, we're going to put a little dot there and I'm going to put mine in red. That point should not change. It still exists. It's still on my final graph. Then I'm going to look for other good points along the quadratic. By good points, I mean points I can tell you a coordinate for. Like this one right here is the coordinate 0, 4, right? Ooh, 0, 4 is in the original, so what point is in the inverse? 4, 0. Okay, so I know there's a point right there. I switched to the x's and y's. I'm going to look for another good point. Another good point I see is this one right here. That on the original graph is 2 comma 0, which means where should I put my point? 0 comma 2. I want a few more because um, I struggle with graphing sometimes. So my other good point is going to be this one right here. That is the coordinate point 3 comma 1. So where should we put a coordinate? 1 comma 3. Okay, we're going to play connect the dots. Now you're connecting the dots with the inverse functions only. It should look like a reflection, which means it should still look like a quadratic just on its side. So when I play connect the dots, it's going to look something like this. Blues and reds only. This 
This is kind of messy, but if you notice, if we were to fold it along that purple dashed line, the quadratic in our inverse relation would end up right on top of each other. They would go over the diagonal. Let's do another one. So what should I start doing first? What's the first step if we're drawing it graphically? The little line. Okay, what's the, what is the equation of that line I'm drawing? Y equal X. It's the diagonal classic linear function with a slope of one and a Y intercept of zero. Okay, fabulous, what's next? Yeah, the ones that like actually touch it. I see three of them. Those are gonna be in my final graph because they're on the line. If we reflect them across that line, they stay right there on the line. Then I'm gonna find good points. I see a good point right here. That is negative two comma zero. So what should I plot in blue? Zero, negative two. Notice my friends who are visual learners. Where am I here? This distance and this distance are the same. That's what it was talking about by a perpendicular line. My brain doesn't work that way, but I know how to do it. This distance, like basically one box distance, diagonal box distance, diagonal box distance. So we can still count it that way. Uh, I see another good point here. I know it's not at that maximum value, but it's still in the corner of that box, so it's a good point. It's at the coordinate point negative one comma two, so where do I plot a point? Two, two comma negative one. Um, do we see another good point? I think we got one more. One comma zero, so we should plot? Zero comma one. Now, this one is a little bit more confusing because now I have a bunch of dots all over my screen. Color coding is gonna be helpful. I am connecting the dots with the blue and the red. So here I go. Whew. I recommend for this, especially when you're putting both graphs on top of each other, maybe use some color coding because otherwise it looks like like a mess. This still looks like a mess, but I'm using color, so it's less messy. Questions, comments, concerns? All right, so what's the point of even doing inverses? Great question. I'm so glad you asked. What do inverse functions do? The same way inverse operations undo an operation, inverse functions undo a function but also allows us to go back and forth between these two with inputs and outputs. If you plug a number into a function, it generally will output a new or different number. So for example, if we plug x equal to two into the function f of x equal to three x minus one, we would get three times two minus one, we would get five. Now, if we took the answer five and we plug it into its inverse function, we should get out two. So we're saying the input and output of one becomes the input and output of the other backwards. We switch the x's and y's. This is because an inverse function will essentially undo a function. So if we plug x into a function and then the output into its inverse function, we should come back and get x again. Now this fact is important for when I'm gonna be asking you to verify that functions are inverses. So on the next page, that's what we're gonna work on. We're gonna verify that different functions are inverses. Now, because I'm taking the output of one function and plugging it into another function, that feels very similar to what we did last time. What is it called when we take one function and put it inside another? It's what we did last time, it starts with a C. Composition. So we're going to be able to do a composition of our inverse functions to determine if they're inverses. So here we go. Two functions. Here's my color code back again. F of X and G of X are inverses if and only if we can do F of G of X and get the value X and the reverse G of F of X 
and get x. So either way, we should be able to put one function in the other in any order and get the same thing out. We said last time that composition was not commutative. It's not unless they're inverses, in which case it is commutative. So to show that the two functions are inverses, we must show that f inverse of f is equal to x and f of f inverse is equal to x. Oh, I forgot this blank was here. So sorry. Let's make that look nicer. So just like we're doing f of g of x and g of f of x, we're going to compose the function inside the inverse and then the inverse inside the function. If both times we do that, we get x as an answer, they are inverses. That's how we verify. Okay, number one, our easy question. Let f of x and g of x be the functions below. Determine, you might see the word verify, that f of x and g of x are inverses. Okay, I'm going to let f of x be the red one, classic, and we're going to let g of x be the blue one. And that, again, classic. The first thing we're going to do is f of g of x. So thinking about what we did with compositions last time, this would be f of g of x. Well, g of x is 1 half x plus 3 over 2. Right, g of x is on the inside, f of x is on the outside. Okay, compositionally, that means I'm going to take that blue function and plug it into the red one exactly where the x is. This would be 2 times something minus 3, but that something in the parentheses is 1 half x plus 3 over 2. What do I do here to simplify? Distribute. I heard it. Thank you. That means it's 2 times a half, which is 1. 2 times 3 over 2, which is 3. And then I'm going to subtract 3. Again, that was this distribution step. Well, what do you notice is going to happen here? What's, what's plus 3 minus 3? Yeah, they cancel each other out, positive and negative, which means we just have x. That's good. One of the directions we're doing this, one of the compositions, gets me x as an answer. We want that. If we compose it the other way, meaning this time I'm switching the order to have G on the outside and F on the inside. If we have that, then they are, if we do this and we get X, then they are inverses of each other. So we would say G with F inside of it. This is 2X minus 3. G is 1 half times something plus 3 over 2. Well, that something is 2x minus 3, and I know you're panicking because there's fractions, but we have to be better. Don't panic with fractions. 1 half times 2x is x. 1 half times negative 3 is negative 3 halves. And then I'm going to add 3 halves. Oh, snap. We have negative 3 halves and positive 3 halves. Again, those are going to cancel each other out, and we're left with x. That's what we wanted. So since we got x from both compositions, from both directions, we can conclude, therefore, the three little dots mean therefore, by the way, therefore, f of x and g of x are inverses. Okay, so we kind of talked about this last class. There are three functions that have a restricted domain. Does anyone remember without looking at your notes? What three functions, the answer is not all real numbers? Logarithm, uh, uh, not absolute value, square root, and then there's one more. One over x, our rational function. So if we are using one of those three, we're gonna have to restrict the domain, which means we're gonna have to restrict the domain of its inverse as well. So again, if you want to write those down for yourself, because maybe it's, it's a good thing to, to start trying to memorize these. We have our rational function, 1 over x, where x cannot equal 0. 
we have our square root of x function where x has to be from 0 to infinity because we can't take the square root of a negative number. And then we have logarithm of x, which I know we haven't studied yet, and that's from 0 to infinity exclusive, meaning not including 0, but like 0 0.00001 counts. So we say from 0 to infinity with the parentheses, not the bracket. If you are using any of these three functions, you are going to have to make sure you restrict the domain. Whether or not your inverse ends up being one of these functions, if you start with one of these functions, your domain is restricted, period. The same way it was for compositions. So for number seven, we're going to show that h of x and k of x are inverses, but only specifically where um, that should say two. Please change this to a two, my bad. Where x is greater than or equal to 2, which is a fancy, nice way of saying from 2 to infinity. And we'll talk about why that works in a little bit. Okay, again, show, verify, determine. We're going to have to do both compositions to be able to show this. Just to put a different color scheme on this paper, I'm going to go green and purple just so it's not all red and blue this whole time. Um, but here's my, red, or my green and my purple functions. So we have... The first time we're going to do h of k of x. All right, so that means we have h on the outside, and we're going to substitute k on the inside. Ooh, big stop. There's a whole square root function I'm using. What's the domain of that square root function? We would normally say from 0 to infinity, but there's extra stuff inside that square root. So instead of 0, what number do I use? 2. Because if I solved that for, uh, for 0, you'd add 2 to both sides, it'd be 2. Just as a funsies, the domain of a quadratic is all real numbers. It's not one of the three with the restriction, so we just know that's from negative infinity to infinity. We keep going. Now it tells me to plug that purple function into the green one, which means I'm going to do something squared plus 2, but that something is this square root of x minus 2. Now inverse functions require inverse operations. What happens when you square something that's square rooted? Goes away. So this becomes just a plain x minus 2 plus 2. Oh, snap. Minus 2 plus 2 cancel each other out. This is just x a good start. Since we used that domain, though, we're going to say that this is only from 2 to infinity. Remember that composition follows it. To verify the other direction, we do k of h of x. So just the opposite direction. So this is going to be k with h tucked inside of it, which is x squared plus 2. So we have k, which is big square root of x, x squared plus 2, minus 2. See how I put it inside? Mm. How can I simplify this? Do we see this? What is negative or plus 2 minus 2? Zero. Zero. So this is just like saying square root of x squared. Well, what is the square root of something squared? x. So voila. If we got both of them to be x, we are concluding that they are inverses. But they are only inverses on this restricted domain from 2 to infinity. And I need to explain to you why. So we're going to make some ugly sketches here. We're going to sketch h and k here on this graph. h is a quadratic that has been translated up two units. So I'm going to start at 2, and I'm going to make myself a, a sketch of a parabola. It doesn't have to be perfect. Does anyone remember what the shape of a square root function looks like? I have not gone over it, so that's me reaching back to algebra 2. You can say no. Okay, great. Thank you for honesty. We don't know. This is uh, basically like... This is the shape of a square root, for lack of better determination. Okay. Normally it starts at 0, but R says minus 2, so we're actually going to move it to the right 2 units. So we're going to start it here at 2, and we're going to go up and over this way. Now the reason that we had to restrict our domain here 
has to do with this reflection. If I were to reflect these graphs over this dashed line here, do they actually land the entire part of the graph? Does it land on top of the other one? No, because this whole piece right here is like missing a whole bottom section. So to make this work, I have to restrict the domain of this green one to allow them to be inverses. Basically what I do is I take this part and I just like um, say, mm, nope, never mind, not from here to here. Now they are reflections of each other. So if they didn't, if we didn't do that, they wouldn't actually be inverses across this graphic, graphical line that we're reflecting. So we have to keep that in mind. If you're using one of the three with restrictions, we got to whoa, pause, and let our spidey senses think about it. I find it easy to graph it and see which part I should get rid of so that they actually match pictures. Okay, let's do another one where there's restrictions on the domain. These two functions are what kind of functions? Rational functions. The denominator cannot be equal to zero. So what number can x not be here? Wait, the denominator? Four. Four minus four is zero, right? So x cannot be four. What can x not be here? Zero. Because if you put x in the denominator, okay. We're going to, again, verify that these are inverses, but only where x is not equal to 0 and x is not equal to 4, because we know we have to take those numbers out. So we've already taken into account the restriction on the domain. To verify, we just compose them with each other. So again, we're going to do n of p of x. If we can get an x out of this and an x out of the other direction, then they're inverses of each other. So we're doing n of... 6 over x plus 4. Which means anywhere there is an x in the n function, I'm plugging in that blue stuff, which looks like this. Ew. Now I got fractions in my fraction. Yuck. But we start simplifying in the easiest way possible. Do you notice something really pretty simple in that denominator? Positive 4, negative 4, what happens there? They cancel. So then I just have 6 over 6 divided by x. Now if you think back to elementary school and in Algebra 2 as well, when you learned about dividing fractions, and I know you divided rational functions, you did this thing called keep change flip. Does that sound familiar? Yes. We keep the numerator. We change the denominator or the operation to multiplication and we flip the denominator, which means this is keep, change, flip. Yes? What happens when you have a six on top and a six on bottom? So all I'm left with is x. That's good, that's what we wanted. Again, what I did there was keep, change, flip. We keep the numerator. We change the divide sign to a multiply, and we flip the denominator. Keep, change, flip. We're halfway there because we proved that the first one, or we showed that the first one, composes to make x. Let's compose it the opposite way. So this time, oh, not g, we're using different letters. This is p of n of x. So again, we're going to plug in the red function this time. which bear with me, looks like this. 6 over 6 divide by x minus 4, and all of that plus 4. Yuck, I got fractions and fractions. Nothing simplifies yet, so I do my keep change flip. If I keep, I keep the numerator as 6. I change that fraction bar to a multiply, and I flip this denominator. And then all of that is plus 4. <laughs> Again, what's on top and bottom? 6. They're going to cancel each other out. So then I just have x minus 4 and then plus 4. Oh, snap. Minus 4 plus 4. Those cancel each other out. This is just x. 
So again, we have verified that they are inverses. The problem itself took care of the domain because we already said in the question, we're only looking where x is not zero and x is not four because we already know that we can't use those numbers. But your spidey senses should start tingling on that one. My main goal for you today is to be able to see inverse functions and write them. So looking a little bit kind of on this page where we are verifying them because that's helpful to see how they're inverses. Um, but mainly like problem number, what number is it? Example three and example four are going to be what we're practicing in class. Your homework is going to practice example fours, okay, but then also some graphs and some tables. But what we're going to practice in class with the question stack you have on your table, and I will bring you the little cards in a second, is just writing those inverse functions themselves.